Hey everybody, you are listening to the Simple Electronics Podcast. I'm your host, Simple Electronics, and with me I have a very special guest today, Bit Looney. How are you? Oh, hi. I'm fine. Thank you for having me. Oh. And yeah, I'm glad I can be here. Oh, the the uh, the pleasure is all mine. I, I still, again, this is great. Every single time I record one of these, I'm flabbergasted by the the people who agree to be on. So I really thank you for coming on. Uh, please don't be. It's like I, I really, uh, when, when you asked me, it's like I already told you that we all are like regular people and we enjoy our passion uh, on the internet. And uh, your format is really cool. It's like very chill. And so I'm glad to be here and talk about stuff. Yeah, it's really chill until I start uh, shilling your your products, but we'll get that further along. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, just in case, by some miracle, some of the listeners don't know who you are, can you introduce yourself and uh, let us know what you do and who you are? Sure. Um, yeah. My uh, so my my let's say my handle is uh, Bitluni, and my real name is Matthias Balvies, and uh, yeah, I'm a YouTube maker. And I started, oh, it's seven years ago or something. And you can watch on my channel uh, a lot of stuff with the ESP32 and ESP8266 microcontrollers. Um, also some other electronics, a lot of LED um, projects as well. Um, and sometimes even like uh, audio or MIDI stuff, but that's not really well viewed. <laughs> yeah, it's. I find it weird. I've uh, perused your channel. Um, well, typically I've watched a few of your videos, but but actually quite a few. But I've perused your channel looking at the popular uploads, and there's some that really stand out. So, like they're. Some of these things are really big in scope, like uh, like the ping pong LED wall. Can you uh, can you go into what inspired you to get started with that and and what it is? Oh, okay. So uh, the inspiration, so the addressable LEDs, it's like I would say a really organic thing. So you will if you do like basic projects with microcontrollers, and um, the first the Hello World project uh, of, of electronics is a blinking LED basically and um, like the individual addressable LEDs is like the continuation of that so you will end up you like doing RGB stuff with with addressable LEDs and um, I found I, I think the first uh, the first LED wall, the RGB LED wall, was with these uh, chain lights. They are not like on the strips. I did some some projects with the strips as well, but um, I wanted to do something with the chain lights. And I was actually inspired by Harry. What's the second name? His name is Harry Fan uh, on on YouTube. Um, he did like um, with ping pong balls. Uh, LED cube and hit his project was much more complicated and, and bigger. He unfortunately didn't get as many views as I did with with uh, my basic wall but and, and I feel bad about it. I even linked uh, in my video I even linked uh, his channel or something um, and I the I, I thought I want to, do something since this was the first time I was um, I was showing something on the May Cafe in Berlin was it was it Berlin or was it Hannover I'm not sure which one it was but um, yeah I wanted to show off as many projects as I can and then the first wall was like I started to do it on Wednesday and I had to pack my car on Friday and go to the Maker Fair. So I thought, okay, let's let's do this. I have all, all the stuff I need. I have some ping pong balls that I ordered months ago uh, and the chain lights and I did it like in 24 hours with, with painting, drilling. And I had only like a steel plate, which was really 
hard to drill. And uh, I did this project like super quick, recorded everything. I edited it, uh, it after, I think, no, I even edited it uh, within these days and then uploaded it when I was on the at the Maker Fair. Um, the video took off, let's say, I don't know, it was not that big, but I gained a lot of subscribers there. So we are we were sitting with Arturo, I don't know if you know him. Um, we are sitting there uh, with Dave Darko, um, sitting there at our stand and uh, we're playing around with, with keyboards and I had a lot of uh, other stuff there. Um, and we were watching my YouTube counter that I made with one of the matrices that also Brian uh, uses a lot. And it gained like 1000 subscribers an hour. And it was like, I was really surprised that that uh, simple video that was like shot in one day and edited in another day uh, took off uh, as quickly as, as that one. And basically um, I wanted to, with, with the other projects after that, second wall was simply bigger, lighter and the third wall uh, was like, uh, I wanted to make it like, so put less effort into, into the assembly because it's way more ping pong balls. The first one was 300 ping pong balls. The last one was, uh, 1,800 or something like that. It was like a lot more work. So. I simply continued on, on that route since it was quite uh, successful, but I really never intended to be the L ping pong LED guy on, on YouTube. No, but it, it did happen. But I, okay, I need to I need to put this into perspective. I've watched that uh, LED wall in 24 hours video uh, about three times. I've watched it most recently getting prepared for this interview. But for some reason, in the three times I've watched it, I it didn't sink in that that was all in 24 hours. Like, of, of course, it's in the title. But when you watch it, like, and the, the viewers really should go watch it. It is incredible the amount of, of blood, sweat, and tears. I think literally blood in, in there, too. Um, yeah. That you put into this thing. Guys, you have to watch this video. He is struggling to get this thing done. And I guess it makes more sense in context. You only had a couple days to do it. Yeah, I had the deadline, yeah. Yeah, because <laughs> even in the video, you're like, well, I have steel. I should have probably used aluminum. But with the timeline in mind, it makes a lot more sense why you did use the steel. Like, yeah, yeah. That's difficult. Yeah, it's... It was like, uh, I, I even had like, okay, there, there was like funny comments about that because I said, okay, I, I'm doing it with all the materials that I already have in my lab. And someone commented, yeah, sure, you have uh, 300 ping pong balls in your lab. <laughs> so it was kind of, I was kind of preparing to do a, pr a, simple, a project like, like that, but I wasn't prepared to do it right there at this point and it wasn't thought through and there is even stuff that isn't shown on camera where it was i was even more suffering to after the drilling which was really hard and i had like pain in my hands for for days or even weeks um there was there was some some on the other side there were some burrs and it got quite messy because I tried to get rid of, of these sharp corners uh, where, where I can put in the LEDs and then I used an angle grinder to get this off and I was I couldn't since it was like in one o'clock in the night or, or something I couldn't go in my garage and do it there because uh, the whole neighborhood uh, would would go crazy on me so I stayed in my lab in the basement of the house and used the angle grinder here and my complete lab was a complete mess because because it was so dusty I put like <laughs> 
So uh, that's the reason why I didn't film it because it was so dusty. I put like I took some sheets or or something and put it around the whole contraption to at least not let the the sparks from the angle grinder reach the carpet. Since I have a carpet here in my lab, <laughs> it was really messy. It's incredible. And, yeah, I can't yeah, believe yeah. you got it done in 24 hours. Like, yeah, uh, that is impressive. I, I think it's even, you can, if you are prepared, you can do it in like maybe three hours or something. So it, I don't think it's really hard. It's basically hard if you use the wrong materials and the wrong tools for, for that. So yeah, I would. So if I were to attempt this today, and obviously I've got the benefit of your iteration, so I don't want the listeners to think that I'm that I'm uh, bagging you for doing it wrong. I would probably go with uh, plywood, and the problem with the plywood is it's a little bit too thick. But I think then you can just glue in the LEDs, and then you'd be you'd be okay. Because yeah, drilling. I mean, I've drilled steel in my life. I'm an automotive mechanic by trade. And it is yeah. not fun. It's not. It's not a good thing to do, especially. Sorry, how many holes did you have to make? Three hundred. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> yeah, if if I would even with a drill press, it would be a different thing. So uh, in the second wall, I actually overcompensated by by uh, welding this hole punch. So I I thought I will never ever again drill so many holes with in my life even not with a drill press because drill press wouldn't work you you have to like to reach the center of, of a whole sheet so and and i made this hole punch so it was like overcompensating in this in this case i didn't use it for the third wall i thought no uh doing it with these leds isn't isn't the right path and i have to do it with like pcbs that are already assembled yeah, that to me, that's the genius part because you decided to go for, I think, was it V2? Yeah, V2, right? Is the the uh, surface mount already? Oh, I don't know the, the name. <laughs> oh, I thought it was... V2, yeah. Version... I, I, I'm not an electro te technician, so so I'm, I'm really just a coder, so... <laughs> no, no, I mean, uh, was it the... the V2. The version what? 2 that, that had the no, LEDs? No, uh, the surface, no. Uh, version 2 was... The big one with aluminium where I punched all the holes. It's like four it's like four walls that are simply bolted together. So that one I took on the next make affair where we all went. Um, so I could transport it easily. So that was version two and version three um, is the surface mount. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that one is uh, incredibly impressive because it seems like you could chain as many of those panels as you want, right? Yeah, you get like okay with you you could. Um, the, the that version actually had had some some minor problems like um, the what what I did wrong on on that one is like that all the five volt rails or you you can't you, they are all connected and since i'm using multiple power supplies you basically short uh, two different five volt rails and if they are like if there's like a regulator and that's a little bit off or something they are like working against each other so that that isn't very optimal and that's something i would like to improve but um, yeah, um, uh, yeah no, I, can can I just say was, though you're not a professional yeah. hardware no, designer. No, 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 no. Like I, I don't want the the viewers to get the wrong impression. Um, Bitlooney is splitting hairs right now. Like this thing is impressive as all hell. Like this is not <laughs> obviously as as makers um, we tend to see the faults in what we make more than anything, but. Just, yeah, sure. just go look at the video. It is so impressive. And he panelized it into these uh, sections of something like, is it 12 by 12? I, I forget now the, the no, LEDs. No, it's 8 by 8. 8 by 8 it's balls. Eight by eight, yeah. yeah, And then he can 
he can take them out. He made uh, daughter boards that sit behind. So basically, it distributes the signal and the 5 volts. So you can actually pull out an individual panel and replace it with an identical one if you want to. And Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's also it's, learned it's... things about, like, gravity and, and not having your wall balancing on a <laughs> short edge. <laughs> Yeah, too bad I didn't catch that on camera. I edited it somehow, like, so you know what happened. But uh, that was one of the rare moments when the camera wasn't running when the wall tipped over. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I do the exact same. I do the exact same thing. I I always do things like my viewers always um, poke me in the comments that they're like, why did you just, why did you do it this way? Why don't you just secure it to X, Y, and Z? And I, you know what? Just, this is the way I was doing it. And it was, it was fine, <laughs> but it could have been a disaster like, like yours. It could have been exactly the same. But I, I after my, it wasn't, it wasn't really like catastrophic or anything. I just had to glue like a ton of ping pong balls again on and, uh had a, to clean up a little bit of a mess there but um it, it wasn't that bad i would say it was beneficial to the to the video at, at a little bit more drama or something yeah added a little a little bit more loony to the i uh, yeah video. And, and, and it's like i had really fun editing this moment because i basically like rotate the view and blend it out and it's dark and then you have some crashing sounds and a, do a dog barking and I don't own a dog and nobody would notice that because dogs usually bark if something's happening and it's like if I don't know if you if, if you have noticed that but that's like a subtle detail that that makes me laugh every time. It's I. It's like I really love doing like spending maybe an extra day editing the video and then adding stuff like that, like a random dog barking while it's something crashing there or something. It's like <laughs> I'm not sure if I picked I, up specifically on the dog, but I know I was too busy laughing when that happened. It was it was well edited at least yeah yeah i have like uh in my videos there's there's like a ton uh, many times i used the wilhelm scream i'm not sure if you're familiar with, with that i've it's like a, yeah i've just yeah. learned about it recently go go ahead and tell the the audience what it what it is okay the wilhelm scream is uh, i think it's from an old western or something like a guy falling from a, from a horse or something was the or origin of that or a guy falling uh, like uh, from a balcony or something when shot in, in a western and this uh, this sample this the scream um, was in a I think a sound effect database or something and it got a meme in the film industry and you you will Notice if you if you heard it once, you will notice it in, in like every second movie. Somewhere is a Wilhelm scream of a guy that's falling uh, somewhere, or, or it, it's like it's a meme going on in, in uh, the film industry. And I I have I, I maybe six seven times. I, I whenever I got the opportunity to put it in, I use it as well. <laughs> I would make a strong recommendation for the viewers out there that are sensitive to repetitive noise. Uh, don't look it up beca <laughs> because then you like, like Bitlooney said, you can't unhear it. So yeah. um, it's actually used three times in the Lord of the Rings series. Like just to show you how like intense it's, it's used. It's used all the friggin' time. And a lot of sound directors, I was reading this on Reddit just literally the other day. Uh, a lot of sound directors put it in where they can simply because it's a meme for them as well. So it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I think the last time I heard it was in, on, I, I think it might be on Mandalorian. So uh, even Star Wars, you, you get a wooden scream. <laughs> it, yeah. It's nuts how that gets re, it gets reused. And the problem is it's from the 1930s, maybe 
originally. Yeah, it's really old. And so it's yeah. super low quality. And a lot of people on Reddit were complaining that the the sound quality drops dramas- dramatically when it comes on. And that's that's the biggest problem people have with it. But yeah. Yeah, I found I found uh, a quite good version uh, online, and I think someone put some effort in to remaster it somehow, or or polish up the quality, or recover it a little bit, because like you have only like bad sampling rate, and and uh, but I found a version that's that's quite quite okay, so. <laughs> That's you know I'm I'm really glad you get a chance to have fun with your videos, but I've noticed that you've only released them about once a month, something like that. How did you come to this schedule? Oh yeah, uh, okay. So um, mm-hmm. when I oh uh, when I went full time YouTube, so I'm 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 doing it full full time. Um, and when I started, I did a video a week and it was, it was a cool schedule, I would say, because I, uh, forced myself to publish like very basic projects. It wasn't very intricate. It's like, uh, doing one simple thing with, with a Wi-Fi microcontroller or like uh, reading one sensor or something and after a while uh, it wasn't enough for me i guess i wanted a little bit more of a challenge so i think things get get boring if you do it like on a weekly basis and uh, you run out of uh, it's becoming repetitive and then i thought okay i give up on this on this uh weekly uh, thing because you burn out that's a like number one uh, thing that happens to to youtubers uh, you you end up with a burnout at some point and i think i i was burned out like two times already um, and then i thought okay let's do it bi-weekly or no, not bi-weekly every two weeks uh, a video and then uh, what also I, I listened to to your uh, podcast with with Brian, and there's like this commitment to I I started Patreon early on, and there is like this you feel obligated to release stuff as well, and so I thought I have to publish something every two weeks. And I, I don't know, the, the projects became like more complicated and I wouldn't want to publish like a multi-part thing like, uh, okay, today I made this part and tomorrow this part. I wanted to like have an impact with one video that covers it all in like 10 minutes or 20 minutes or something. And um, yeah, it's it's somehow naturally uh, went this route. And I think last last year, when you can imagine like developing a huge LED wall with designing the boards and and stuff, uh, that's that's a lot of work. You can't do something like that even in a month. I started developing it. It was. The third third version, I started developing it with uh, first first talks I had with PCBWay because I wouldn't be able to pay for that even at at that point it was uh, 2018 I think November or something, and at that point that was my financially my lowest point in the last last years where um, it was quite close that I would have to pick up another day job. And that was like, um, it was close to 100,000 subscribers back then, but I had higher expenses at that point than income. And um, that was, but 
it was like the turning point and PCBWay also, they, of course, they're the sponsor that they paid me and they paid for all the boards because like manufacturing so many boards with assembly and they are large, they are 32 by 32 centimeters, gold plated and, and stuff like that. So it, I think the material cost alone were over a thousand dollars, like if you would order it like that, it, what was quite a lot. And I talked to them and said, okay, finally, I have a project that we can do together because I will, they, they asked me, they asked me on regular basis if I want to do a project with them. And that started, I started designing the boards, I think in November and I, when, when did I release it? Was it like March, April? I don't know. The <laughs> V3? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not seven months ago. Let's see. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. So even later. So it took quite a while from start um, from start to the end. Yeah, we're talking developing it, I think. June, July for those listening at home. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I had some shorter projects in, in, in the middle, like super easy ones like the uh, mini uh, PCB mill that I, I I basically ordered one because I wanted to to try one like a toy and that video surprisingly is the best video I ever made because it has like 1.5 million views I was really surprised by by that I didn't I don't look at my analytics anymore and uh, recently I took a look and I was like surprised by like 10 million minutes viewed. And uh, yeah. <laughs> that's impressive. Yeah, you, you deserve yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and that's um, also, I'm not sure um, that might be, so <laughs> we started like, with uh, the schedule and like these projects, they are so impactful. Okay, I wouldn't say the LED wall pays a lot of my bills, as, but, but like a simple project, like the minimal pays even more of my bills. <laughs> I'm not sure how to, yeah, how to say. Yeah, I get, I get what you mean. Like it, it gives you a little bit of, little bit of an income boost. Yeah, yeah, I, I get like, I was in the, in the beginning of beginnings of my channel, I was really dependent on, on the support of my Patreons and I'm really, I'm really grateful for that because I wouldn't be able to keep it up until the point like the, the turning point at uh, like end of 2018. I was really running out of money. I had like, maybe I could pay the, the, my rent for the next two months and that was everything I, I got left and I wouldn't, I hadn't like secure income. And like, if you add up like the $400 that I get from Patreon right now, and it was similar back then, I think it might be two, 300 or something that added up to like let me pass that the threshold where at the end I from the sponsors and from the from the YouTube income and the affiliate marketing I get enough where I can actually live from and finance my future projects so uh, I'm really grateful for all my patreons and but I'm also I I have to admit that I'm not uh, dependent on on uh, that support anymore i'm still grateful and i still feel the pressure that i have to deliver for my supporters but i would also say um you can you can rather take take the money that you support me with and get youtube premium for that <laughs> because uh that helps even other makers or or 
support makers that that are like on the edge like i was back there and i'm not at the moment and um, if you just uh, get youtube premium or something you don't skip the ads anymore because you don't see any ads on on youtube and that you get a way better experience uh, using youtube and the makers get paid because you watch their videos and if they have monetization on they will get a share from YouTube Premium. I think the viewers that use YouTube Premium, uh, their views are worth like 50 times the money that a regular viewer watching ads are worth. Um, now, that being said, we're not talking about giant numbers because 50 times of yeah. like a fraction of a penny is not a lot. But yes, if a lot of people use uh, YouTube Premium and watch your videos, you get a lot more. So basically, yeah. I, I make. I think I think I would make the same amount of money um, as ad revenue. Um, like I think it would it would add up if like something like one percent of my viewers or or two percent of my viewers were YouTube Premium viewers. It's it's something like that. Oh really? Okay. It's like yeah. I I I, I didn't check it, but uh, I know I I since I got like. Uh, YouTube Premium myself because I got like not only the benefit I am watching a lot of YouTube and uh, it the ads got really out of <laughs> out of hand there and I couldn't stand watching it like for an hour and you got like ads every five minutes sometimes and that adds up. If you watch like me, let's say f three hours a day, that adds up probably to 15, 20 minutes of ads that sometimes aren't even skippable. So that's really spending one uh, 13 euros a month or something is totally worth the money to spend it on. And I even support the people that are creating the content uh with, with with that so uh basically it's like <laughs> it, the the opinion might not be very popular to say okay rather rather than spending that on on patreon uh, go for youtube premium but if you think about it there is like the discuss discussion no mid rolls and um when I had like last year, I had quite some. So the, the Corona year, I had quite some some uh, struggles with. Uh, so my my mother died. And at that point, that was like July, August and, and such. They turned on the mid roll by default. That was in the beginning of, of August. And I didn't release anything at that time. And simply because I didn't turn the ads on, um, I got a lot more income from, from the ads that saved me at that time. And I could concentrate on solving my private issues uh, and taking care of everything uh, and, and still got covered. And that's why I'm... Um, I'm hesitating to turn that off and I found the solution. Okay, I don't turn ads on for for the pre-release when I publish it like early on Patreon or GitHub uh, sponsorships. Uh, I don't have ads turned on then uh, if I don't do a mistake. And then for like the first day, I only do pre-roll because all the fans that are subscribed gets notified and watch like the su subscription fee feed they will see, get a pre-roll they they can skip it if they want and after that i can turn on the mid rolls and all like the people that come randomly to to my channel they will see mid rolls if they don't have youtube premium that that's that's how it goes yeah yeah and you're right <laughs> like that's a good way to do it um I have one video that exploded in popularity 
and I think it's at 350,000 views, which is a lot for my channel. My next highest is about 80,000 or so. But um, that one gets a lot of randos coming in from all over. And that's the only video I turned mid rolls on because um, if I'm going to have to deal with the abuse in the comment section, they're going to have to deal with the mid rolls. <laughs> that's my that's my thing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. If you get a lot of random people, they are they they, they are asking why I am here <laughs> or something. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> fine, I'm fine, following fine. the advice of uh, Do you know Linus from Linus Tech Tips? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think, which is good. I think everyone knows about him. But on the Wan Show, his own podcast, he's he said that um, small creators shouldn't be running ads at all. Now it's a it's a tough thing to swallow when you're a small creator and you're like, well, you know, I'm I I don't have any income from this, right? Like I'm I'm getting a little bit personally, but uh, you know, the channel costs are still way higher than the income. But um, yeah. he said, don't run any ads because your priority as a small creator is to grow. And ads are discouraging people from yeah. sticking around sometimes. And I think it might be a little bit different now with YouTube going nuts with the ads. They just they put them on even if you're not monetized now. Hmm. But uh, but yeah, that was the wisdom, uh, you know, up till about you know six months ago when YouTube went crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's also, okay, I, I can agree on that because it doesn't matter if you get like $5 or $10 a month back from YouTube and, um, but, but you, you get like the people that come to your channel in the beginning, are maybe the core fans that you will keep for ages. And you already starting to annoy them with mid rolls. I can un to totally understand that that you wouldn't, you are not dependent on that ten dollars, uh, the month. So, I can I totally get, get it. But there is also the discussion. What does YouTube do to videos that are not monetized? So a lot of people get the impression, okay. Unless I don't like friend from friend friends lab, she always say, said, "Okay, I if I don't monetize my video, uh, don't get any views." That's so yeah, that's possible. We we don't. The problem is they don't. There's no transparency with YouTube, right? They don't tell us yeah. anything. I, I'm not sure if there is a clear message if that's true or not. I'm. I'm watching Creator Insider, that's a channel from the YouTube team. And the, the question was asked a lot. They, I think they are a little bit vague on, on that. Usually they say it shouldn't matter, but they say it shouldn't matter, not it doesn't matter. <laughs> that's right. So, yeah, it's like, um, I, I get it that they probably don't even know what the algorithm is doing anymore because it's like probably AI or something and it get, it's getting on some things, it's getting out of hand. Like recently they, <laughs> the spiffing Brit released the ex exploit, YouTube exploit video and everybody hopped on it and uh, put post, uh, poll posts on, on their channels and that's really annoying. I, I thought of doing this as well, but I didn't at the end. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't end Not up sure. either. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's just, I guess the way I look, I can give the viewers out there my insight on it. It might be wrong, but the way I look at it is YouTube is a business and they've done some pretty creative accounting to end up in the negative all the time, right? They always claim a loss, but the way I see it is small creators, it's it's incumbent on the creator themselves to drive traffic to their channels. YouTube really would like you to bring people onto their platform. It's just simple. To me, it makes sense in a business sense. So I feel like it's your job as a small creator to drive traffic to your own channel. Once the YouTube algorithm picks up that some people are clicking on videos more than usual, 
or they're staying on the video more than usual, then YouTube as a business, I can see them going, well, it might be profitable to spread this video around, to spread this thumbnail around and see if people are clicking it. And so they do, you know, they show it on people with relevant interests front pages. And if those people click on it at a higher rate than usual, then they're going to show it to more people and more people. And that's how it spirals. You know, you get the algorithm blessing like I got on my battery video where I got a click through rate of like 13% or something for a little oh, bit. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was like That's crazy. huge. Yeah. And, um, and because, you know, my, all my video was searchable as well, which was, which was the, the, the big, the big gotcha. But yeah, basically, I feel like the algorithm kind of tests the markets, tests the waters all the time. And it's not profitable for them to have a small creator with small views because they can't, um, they can't negotiate um, ad rates for as high of a dollar amount as they can for a giant channel. Like I'm sure advertisers were, you know, chomping at the bit to try to get their advertisements on PewDiePie's channel, for example, or, mm. or Ninja or whatever, whoever is the, the big, the big players, the, the Logan, Logan Pauls of the, of the <laughs> platform. So I think that's the, I think that's the crux of it. I view, YouTube's actions in terms of how a business works and I think mm. so far like obviously it could be confirmation bias but so far that's kind of been my understanding of how YouTube's algorithm works yeah yeah that they have to tune it because if you say okay they they promote everything that catches attention of the people and drags people on the platform you might end up with something like 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 going on, on on Facebook, you have a lot of controversial stuff that's promoted. If you you have somehow to moderate it, I'm not sure YouTube does a good job there because like you get a lot of um, stuff like misinformation spreading. Like on, on I I don't want to say. Facebook is evil or anything, but you get some kind of echo chambers there. And um, it's it's a quite dangerous thing to do just to promote stuff that's, that's controversial and that's viewed quite often. So I always, what, what I'm concentrated on, they're like trends. Of course, you have to have a nice thumbnail that provide that that gives an impression what you will to, you will see there. But there is also like a time where uh, unbelievable caught on camera explosion emoji whatever, <laughs> and that was clicked the most. And they had to change it a little bit. I think it's this this whole machine is so complicated. They try to tune it with with like really small levers and and knobs to somehow work but they probably don't even know how how it works no i'm sure <laughs> i'm sure they don't right it becomes well it's like um when i'm doing these podcasts sometimes i'm asking people about uh projects they've done three years ago and they don't quite remember the details and i can assume if you scale up to like a large software algorithm with hundreds of programmers that have had their their fingers in the pie so to speak it gets even worse right you just don't remember what what happened or what's happening yeah um yeah that that on one side on the other side you have this ai features you have to have them because um you can't write like code that parses all kinds of descriptions and analyzes the descriptions if then else or, or something they have to somehow get the information only from from the description what this is what they did at the beginning that's why we had th those tags that aren't even looked at anymore and the, the uh, like the title of the um, of the video but now they have even like 
something installed which analyzes the thumb thumbnail because they had to do that because uh, guys took like clickbait thumbnails and they had to analyze the thumbnails and uh, like classify if you see a butt on on the thumbnail you don't promote it or you something something like that they had to extend the algorithm for ai features and even more since they parse like audio and generate like subtitles automatically already they have some similar features i would imagine for the video itself because they also suggest certain thumbnails to you which they think are attractive so there are so many features that are working already with like data mining and ai which are like grown like a brain and you can look inside that and analyze okay this code line has to be changed they can't do that anymore they can only say okay the ai got out of hand at this point we have to somehow force it in the other direction like a, like a horse you know, and they're sitting on the wagon and try to control the horse but it's a wild horse that has its own brain <laughs> <laughs> just wants its, yeah, its apples you know yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a carrot on a like <laughs> carrot on. Yeah, it's uh, like a carrot on a, fishing, a stick. Fishing line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like a carrot on a stick. Except in this case, it's I think at this point it's another horse holding that carrot on a stick. I, I'm not sure yeah. if there's any anybody on the wagon is in control anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least okay, well, they'll claim that you know. Yeah. So. Two YouTubers talking about YouTuber stuff. You know Let, what? Let's let's. It, it is. It just we, is what it is. There's no. There's no structure here. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's, yeah. Okay. Well. So, redirecting. Uh, is there anything specific you wanted to you wanted to talk about? If you if we want to get back onto on track, because I've got questions for you. If not. Yeah. Sure. No. So I, you've actually done. Um, a great project that's been in the back of my mind for a long time. And just speaking of YouTube algorithms, this is right up my alley, but somehow I have not even heard about it until, uh, geez, a few months ago. You built an electric go-kart from scratch. Can you, uh, can you tell us about that a little bit? Oh, that's, that one isn't very hot. Uh, I think that was even... Um, that was at the same time when I built the LED wall. I thought, uh, how was it? Okay, I built the LED wall, I think on uh, Wednesday and on Thursday I built the cart or something. <laughs> you realize you're, you're giving me a, like a depression here because of the amount of stuff you can get done is incredible. <laughs> no, no, really. Okay, what I did before I did the cart is I uh, made like the scooter, electric scooter project. And basically I got familiar with all the stuff that you need to get um, uh, BLDC uh, motor running. It's very simple. It's like you get a VESC that's like a controller, speed controller. You connect three wires to the motor and connect two wires to the battery and then basically you have to take like a, a normal potentiometer connected to that and you are done that's that's like five wires to connect and two additional for the controller he, it's really really simple he's downplaying like, it he's downplaying it folks he welded a frame no he put a yeah seat i welded on it. a frame but he, you you could simply like put a wooden frame together it's it's as sim simple as that i wanted to weld something or i had like the metal there and uh, but yeah it the the cart <laughs> i have even a seat from a car it's a ford fiesta seat that i put on the cart <laughs> It's very simple, simple made. It can. So the problem is I wanted to have like tank steering. So the um, 
um, wheels would turn in the opposite uh, ways to, to turn around. But that's really hard to do with, uh, with tires. And I had really problems to, to control it or to yeah, tur turn around. It had like really long curve on um, like pavement or something. It would have like really big turn radius. Um, but on like dirt, it was really cool. It was like <laughs> going nuts. And I, I even, since I had like a small uh, accident with one of the BLDC motors for the uh, scooter, I connected a too high voltage battery pack to it and tried stuff and it burned out. The, the motor had like a short and the cables flew off because the currents have been so high. And um, then when I built the cart, since I paid like maybe at this point, the controllers have been quite costly. I think 80 euros a controller and the motor was shipped also like 80 euros. And at that point I didn't have like so much spare money for, for the project. And I burnt uh, one controller and one motor just by doing a s simple thing wrong. So with the cart, I went really con conservative with the currents and uh, with the voltage. So I think um, since each of the motors for each wheel is a built-in motor, uh, it was each of the motors is uh, like one kilowatts. Yeah, they so are. I, yep. <laughs> I could maybe use twice as much power on that project, but I never continued with that. I wanted to do some actual um, let them let the wheels rotate on the spot so I can do like a self-driving car, but I stopped that at some point because it was either too complicated or other things came up like LED walls and, and stuff like that. So, but the, the project itself was really simple. It's like connecting a VESC controller to a BLDC motor and a LiPo pack. That's, that's all you need. And then you can even use um, a nunchuck to control it. Yeah, I'll tell you, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how simple it seems to you. The end result is amazing. To see you booting around a gravel parking lot with this thing going, you know, probably too fast for the lack of safety features on this thing <laughs> is hilarious. Because, so guys, you got to go watch this video because there's, there's only 31,000 views. Like I can't, I, I can't believe, see the algorithm failed again. But He's got four uh, thousand watt hub motors, so they're basically like they look like scooter wheels with a brushless motor built in. Yeah, yeah. And it's on a tiny platform with a super short wheelbase, so you can picture like like a shopping cart type thing. And he's sitting up high on this chair, so his center of gravity is high. The thing looks scary. And just so you know, about 750, I think it's about 750 watts is one horsepower. So if you're yeah. used to horsepower, this is like five, five horsepower to move. Oh, geez. Bitloony looks maybe, I don't know, 150 pounds or something. <laughs> that's all. Yeah, that's, that's about correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it is crazy. And just watch the video, look at the look on his face and you'll be sold on trying to build your own. This this thing is awesome. <laughs> oh, really? I'm surprised that 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 someone noticed. I, I had really quite some fun building that. It, it was even, I think it was simpler to build than like the LED wall, I would say, uh, which I built at the same at the same time. And uh, it, it is quite, now you can get all this, these parts like the, uh, clones for, uh, of the VESC controller, since this is an open source project, you can get them even really cheap for like 30 bucks or something. And you only need one of them 
And there are so many tutorials out there that use this controller. And um, it's, it's not, I, would, I wouldn't say it's foolproof because um, handling the lipos is a little bit sketchy at some point you have so high currents that you you can you can do stuff wrong uh, one of my roommates when when i was living in darmstadt uh, i was living in a house with three other nerds that have have been doing really crazy stuff like one of them was building a fusion reactor in the basement so uh and and he also he built like um an electric bike and he was only charging uh one of the biggest lipos you can get was charging it in this room and it blew up and the heat of this lipo which was sitting next to the window was so high that the glass broke from the window and we were lucky that nothing else caught fire, but it was like super crazy at the, at that time. So, uh, and also that gave me the inspiration um, to uh, do one like this small sketch. Um, which video was that? So I, I, I did one one video where my lab is exploding because of a uh, lipo t uh, catching fire. Uh, I'm just looking for it now. I'm not sure uh, which one was. It's got to have a clickbait thumbnail, right? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> you know. And I like I okay, but it's like it took me ages to to render that. I did like fire simulations in Blender and an explosion and, and something like that. It was fun to do. Uh, yeah, we'll well, one of my we'll find older it. videos. Yeah, yeah, we'll find it. I'll put it in the show notes for people to watch. <laughs> but you see, it's, okay. it's stuff like that, like the go-kart, for example. So you've got four hub motors on that at, um, yeah. and they're about, I'd say in Canadian, they're about a hundred bucks a piece. The VESCs are about 100 bucks Canadian a piece. So you need four and four, right? So that's mm -hmm. eight. And then the LiPo batteries, um, there's six cell LiPo batteries. And they're actually, you have an eBay link. I'm going to check it real quick. Oh, yeah. Um, the LiPos, that, that was one of the most expensive parts, I think. How much? I, I paid like 400 bucks for all the LiPos. Yeah, they're about 80 bucks uh, American, I can see, for each pack. So... Yeah. It's that kind of stuff that I wish I made a little bit more money off YouTube to to be able to to afford and to do. It seems like once you start getting a little bit more income, and don't forget, like people like BitLooney have to pay for their bills too off this, right? It's not not all the yeah. money that comes out of it has to can go back into the channel. You have to live, but. Yeah, true. Yeah, I I can actually share this because this uh, this is probably going live in like six weeks after we record something like that. So I have a three D printer project that my Patreons are well aware of, but nobody outside of uh, of that knows. And it's uh, so far I've tabulated the cost, and I'm up over six hundred dollars just in parts. Mm. It's uh, it's expensive, like stuff. Make, doing cool stuff sometimes can be very expensive. Yeah, I I agree. Uh, the it, you have to justify it so, somehow if it's only a hobby. If for you if it's a hobby to build this three D printer, I don't know if you have like you have to justify it uh, in front of your wife. Oh, honey, I need another two hundred bucks for some parts, or, or because I need to build that thing there. Uh, I'm not sure if it's like like that, but um, it it might be just for a hobby. It might be hard to justify it at some points because you don't even know what the outcome is. So in my case, the card was the least profitable 
it was like a, I dumped so I dumped 1000 euros in that project alone and it had 30,000 views I didn't regret it because I can reuse the controllers I reuse the batteries I use even reuse the hub motors um, but uh, if I wouldn't enjoy making uh, so much, I wouldn't do it uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. one single time anymore because it's like, who pays 1,000 euros for something that at the end is like giving you back $30 in ad revenue or something? <laughs> and you're not driving this thing to the grocery store and back. No, no, no. It's comp <laughs> uh, it's highly illegal here in Germany. You will, you can. It's like felony. Oh you, wow! You can't, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I have to like. It's, um. So, you know, Great Scott. I do. He's a cool guy, by the way. Uh, I met him already on at the Maker Fair, and we wanted to do a project together, but we are. We both are so busy and it postponed so many times at this point. I'm really ashamed <laughs> that I didn't push it further. Um, but he also built like this uh, electric bike. He did. And yeah. we have so, so, um, so many regulations on that that he at the end of the video took it apart again and said, okay, I can't drive it because it's illegal. So because he's putting on the video on, on YouTube, it's public. And if the police would see that he's driving it on public roads, he would be fined. So it's like, it's, it's hard to do like this, this stuff which is especially now we have also regulations for drones and, and stuff like that. So uh, that's why I'm driving like this cart on this gravel parking uh, thing, as well as my scooters. They are not, okay, I think uh, I drove them on, on the road, but that was before the regulations for scooters came in. So that was one of the reasons why I built the scooter with uh, this um, kick detection. So uh, that was like a, a gray, gray area uh, in the regulation back then. And now it wouldn't be legal anymore. But that was one case where I was comfortable sharing that I used it on the street because it's what, it was a gray area. But now I wouldn't be able to do this video anymore. Wow. Oh. Yeah. It's, uh, you are free to do everything you want on private properties if uh, you only endanger yourself. But if you are moving to the public space, you can't use like self-built uh, motored uh, things there. Does it get uh, does it get really cold uh, over where you live in in winter time? Uh, not anymore. I think I, I I can't remember the last time it was minus twenty, like it was for you, like few weeks ago a few days ago <laughs> i don't know a few days ago <laughs> yeah. okay yeah no minus 20 we we hadn't for for many years now i am I th like we had we had no snow last last winter i think the canadian climate is what saves these electric home-built vehicles and let <laughs> me explain nobody rides them well I, nobody is in big quotes there are people all sorts of people here but Nobody rides them when it's like snowing or in the negative. So all the discussions about whether or not we should outlaw, you know, basically electric bicycles that can go 40, 50 kilometers an hour, 70 kilometers yeah. an hour at times, um, they go away because half of the year they're useless. It's not a big deal. So people only complain about them during the summer when we see them, when they're around, and it just leaves the public perception after you know you know give it a couple of months it'll snow and then and then the problem goes away so i think <laughs> i honestly think that's a reason why because right now 
everyone complains about it in the summer. They're like, well, are these people, should they be on the road? Should they be on like within traffic? Should they be on the side of the road in a bike lane? Are they allowed in our, um, we have cross Canada, um, bike trails basically, and they have a speed limit on them. It's not written anywhere because nobody can, can, I think it's 20 kilometers an hour. So not many people can ride a bike at 20 kilometers an hour for an extended period of time, but these yeah. electric bikes can. So yeah, this is, this is the, the, the thing, but it, it's nothing's happened with it. And I'm guessing it's because half of the year, these things don't exist. Yeah. It feels like it might be the way to go to just to limit the speed on the bike roads. Like, like you, you have in Canada. Yeah. Yeah, it's not posted anywhere, but um, if you go look it up, it's I think it's 20 kilometers an hour. And I okay. think they've started putting up signage now because of the e-bikes mm. and stuff. And a lot of people have like e-scooters, like the full like sit on, like you have your, your, your legs in front of you type scooters, like halfway to a motorcycle, basically. Yeah. And they ride those on, on those trails. But uh, yeah, I think I think that's what it is. Like it has to be regulation. Do you have like a electrical snowmobiles or like how mm. do you call them? You know, snowmobiles, you're right. Uh, yeah. We don't, not not in any big sense of the word. Like there might be some one-offs here and there, but it's not a it's not a big thing. It there's a there's a strange intersection where people who are into snowmobiles and four-wheelers in the in the summer um, yeah. They don't seem to be pro electric cars, pro regulation. Uh, yeah, you, sure. You know what I mean? Sure. Like a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you have those kinds of people in in Germany, but but here rednecks. For sure. Yeah, red. Yeah, yeah rednecks. We basically. Have. <laughs> no, we don't want to trash talk people, but uh, uh, yeah, sure. Of course, of course, there are people that, yeah, that just enjoy. Yeah, <laughs> power sports basically. <laughs> but yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's not a lot of electric, and which I find odd because, um, well, anyways, I teach I teach the automotive trade, so I get rednecks all the time because they're kind of part of it's part of the culture to love uh, cars and engines and stuff like that. I get these these young apprentices in all the time, and mm. they are scared that electric cars will take over because they love, you know, fueled engines with pistons. And they're like, oh, I need that acceleration. I need that sound. I need whatever. But I'm telling them, if you really care about acceleration, electric motors are the way to go. They go yeah. full torque at zero RPM. It's insane. Like, yeah. and even if you're into gasoline engines, there are large inefficiencies in gasoline engines. If you add an electric motor to just take over those inefficiencies, you're 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 dreaming. Like you're you're gonna go. You'll be going down the the autobahn and spending no gas. You know, it's it's insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I I I completely understand what you mean. It's it's a little bit strange and uh, one really. Uh, That, that's like a super perverted thing is that they want they want regulations here that you have to build in an engine sound into your electric car because otherwise like blind people wouldn't hear it or uh, you need some awareness that there is a car coming and this is so That's like, for me, it's like, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. You have like obvious noise pollution by combustion engines and you have the chance to get rid of it. And then you want to regulate like, so they have to put on like an engine sound that uh, people, I don't think... Uh, it's the problem no, nobody asked like a blind person if he hears a ca car coming the tires are loud enough oh yeah usually. absolutely i know um one of my dad's best friends has been blind since he was 18 and um he gets 
I mean, honestly, he's smashed into things far fewer times than I have, and I'm perfectly well sighted. So yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think this is um, the over um, being overly sympathetic. Um, if there was a coalition of people representing blind people that wanted this, then I'd be more understanding. But I think you're right. I think it's um, it's uh, the quote unquote uh, ableist ableist people uh, speaking for for the blind because. Yeah, you can, you can hear a car, even with no engine, from quite a yeah. distance, and in fact, I think we have some electric cars here that I've heard they hum, they have a weird like, a, a weird like humming noise that they make purposefully just for that. But it's just, it's weird. It's very strange. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 strange. Um, what? Maybe you know it because you are like. Uh, very well thought and in, in this you're a professor in, in these things aren't you yes uh, I, I am yeah, yeah so um was there a time where there have been hybrid cars that used uh, like horse horses and an engine on top hmm That's a good question. I don't really get into the history of it too much. I can't. I don't. I don't think so. I'm. I'm. Yeah, I don't. Or maybe a hybrid between like steam power and a gasoline engine, or electric engine and steam power. That would be interesting to know because we have like this discuss discussions where you have like the auto lobby. That's especially in Germany. We don't want to talk too much politics, but in Germany, it's quite we have a quite heavy lobby on uh, combustion engines. Um, it, it got better the last the recent years since since uh, um, Volkswagen uh, released the ID3 model and and stuff like that. Um, But there's like this lobbyism that's so comparable to lobbyism ag against the combustion cars or uh, electric trains or whatever back then. So like there was like this horse lobby uh, 100 years ago that, that was lobbying ag against combustion engines. And now we have the same. So just looking back at the history yeah. should, should just... Let us see, okay, that's the way to go because it was like that 100 years ago. It's the same with Corona. There was like same discussions like uh, with, with the Spanic flu. Was, everything is just repeating 100 years later again. Yeah, history definitely repeats itself. That's, um, but yeah, it's, that's very interesting thought because when... Like when I explain hybrids to the students, I, I try to, I try to, to show it like this, like you have a gasoline engine and it has a reservoir and that reservoir you fill with chemical energy and that energy gets transformed into mechanical energy through the engine. Um, then when you have a full electric car, you have um, basically chemical energy in the form of a battery that uh, turns into mechanical energy in the form of an electric motor. Now, the benefit why people love gasoline engines, why we've used gasoline engines for the longest period of time, like we didn't use steam for all that long, and um, and yeah, now we're using electric sort of, is because you can refill that chemical energy in a fuel tank a lot faster than you can a battery and so the appeal of a hybrid is that you get the best of both worlds in fact there are hybrids that use only electric motors and batteries yeah, pl plug in yeah yeah and there's some that use that plus they have a gasoline engine but that engine is not connected to the wheels it is only a generator so that's kind of like the the best of both worlds we can run a gasoline engine at its peak efficiency by controlling the load on the on the generator. And that means your fuel goes a lot further. But, I mean, you do lose some in conversion, obviously, but then you get the, the best of both worlds. And I think for 
steam and gasoline, there was just no there was no way to get two giant mechanical contrivances onto like a a cart or a train or something and still eke out enough efficiency to make them make them work for you because essentially the gasoline engine is the same as the steam engine you need fuel you need uh, charcoal or whatever to heat up the water source in fact steam engines were really not that efficient because you had to stop to fill up with water yeah all the time there was these big water tanks on the side so i think that's why those kinds of hybrids are not as well known as the electric gasoline hybrids and i think honestly the electric gasoline hybrids are a result of auto manufacturers dragging their feet for a long time on, you know, yeah. battery tech, for example. That for sure. That for sure. The, it was like, um, it's like very comfortable here for for the industry in Germany, especially. Um, they had like they have like very good relations to uh to the politics and they sold many cars to china and and stuff like that but they just missed the trend they just i don't know how you could miss that like if you're following the tesla and I, I I don't get it how you can see even with the first S model that it's actually viable. Yep. They completely missed that, ignored it for another 10 years here in Germany. And now they are just announcing big uh, steaming clouds here. This is the new ID3, but you can't buy it. Or, or <laughs> It's like, I, I'm... I'm really disappointed, let's say, and I hope that um, that that a lot changes now, and we see a lot of change right now. So. Oh yeah, and like <laughs> as a maker, like for yeah. example, when when I see what Tesla is doing with batteries, the Gigafactory, for example what they're doing yeah. with uh, solar panels. Mind you, like I think their solar panel stuff is a bit more gimmicky, but it doesn't matter. They're still manufacturing more solar panels. What they're doing with electric motors and the electrification of everything, all this stuff trickles down to us makers. If we can get cell density, um, electrical density, to be a lot higher on new age batteries, that means mm-hmm. our projects are going to be able to be miniaturized and powered up like up go up in the power so for example your led wall wouldn't it be awesome if it was all controlled by like one bank of batteries that weighed you know half a kilo yeah sure like why wouldn't we want that like it all affects us as makers so i feel like all this technological advancement say what you want about elon and his opinions but what he's doing is all a net positive in my opinion Oh yeah, sure, sure. I um, the the announcements about um, the improvements in his uh, battery manufacturing um, with uh, so many people have expected like super high end stuff or new chemistry or anything, but he only showed like manufacturing improvements but these added up and i couldn't understand why everybody was like shitting on him oh that's not that great and uh, the expectations uh, haven't been matched or or whatever but i was really surprised or i was really like i'm i see a really huge improvement what they accomplished there because if you can simplify the process or if you can remove parts from the whole system and such that you per weight you get like 50% more energy that's a huge improvement 
that there wasn't such an improvement for 20 years probably. So I don't know why some, most of the people probably that are not very like super interested in, in that stuff don't get that that might be like a, even another game changer, especially for Tesla, since now the others have to catch up with that, with that new battery technology that have some structural parts, uh, like intrinsic structural integrity. You don't have to uh, cool it that much because um, the heat is dissipated on a over a bigger area and, and stuff like that. So it's like many improvements in this new battery tech. And I'm curious to see um, when the first cars are released, how the perception of, of this improvement will change again. Absolutely. And I'd like to, to have the listeners go watch your go-kart video. And because I want to explain <laughs> something. Now, you used lithium polymer battery packs typically used in, in RC cars, basically. Yeah. And if you look at those packs, they are very uh, flat and wide. And the reason for this, uh, for those of you listening, I'm sure I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but for the listeners, um, the reason that those packs are flat and wide is because they need a large surface area on the electrodes to be able to produce a lot of current at very low resistance. Now, a lithium ion cell is all wound around into like a spiral and there's typically a tab welded on the electrodes that gets pinched or welded onto the actual cell body itself the, both poles well what tesla has done is instead of using a tab welded at one end of the electrode the entire electrode continues further and and so the whole surface gets connected to positive and ground so even with zero changes in chemistry, these batteries are able to deliver more current and they're able to stay cooler with literally like a 1% like a, a, a cost increase. So these kinds of technologies are important because as you uh, use the energy out of a cell, its internal resistance will cre create a voltage drop so you can't actually use some of the energy in the cell until you let it cool and then you can pull a little bit of current after. But just the fact that you can keep driving your vehicle for longer without overheating the battery or, you know, without with eking out a little bit more um, uh, capacity out of it, that is the big increase here. So that is important. It doesn't matter your opinion. That is, that is something that is positive. It's a good thing. Yeah, I, that's the best explanation I heard for ages. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. And uh, there, uh, in uh, looking at my card, I had like maybe that's a good point that you say. Um, there is a lot of current that you need to get a like acceleration to move a like heavy vehicle. And I used lithium polymer batteries and I used mm, several where I needed more battery packs to put them in parallel to get the current uh, that I need to move uh, the vehicle. So if you imagine I spent, what, what did I say, 400 euros on batteries alone for this project. And Usually I would be able to get the same voltage with only, I, I'm not sure how many packs did I use, maybe eight packs. And I could only, I, it would be sufficient, sufficient with four packs to get the same voltage for the motors to, to rotate, to drive, to get maybe the power that I need. But the current was the problem at this point. So I had to put like, let's say two huge batteries in parallel, no, yeah, in parallel to get the current that I need to drive this vehicle. And if I would like had the access to these kinds of batteries that, that Tesla will now manufacture, 
I could like spend half that money for this specific project because I don't need to write this this uh, card for ages or something. I don't need to get like 100 kilometers out of it or something. Exactly. I just want to have a little bit of fun for like maybe 10 minutes or 20 minutes and that's all. And it would be sufficient to take like a pack that's half as expensive and has half uh, the energy stored, but can deliver twice, uh, twice the current. Exactly. So current was a limiting factor here, which have driven the cost of especially my project. Exactly. And there you go. So from the mouth of a maker, you would have <laughs> saved money if uh, Elon would have not, not only if Elon, if the manufacturers would have invested in this type of research 10 years ago when actually the first Prius is maybe 14 years old now, something like that. So mm. there was a need for them. There was a market for them 14 years ago. There was a need for batteries 14 years ago. If we would have started investing hard 14 years ago, imagine what kind of battery tech we'd have today. But bringing that back around to projects, because I see the time is actually flying. This is this has been great. <laughs> yeah, I'm rambling a lot. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. The podcast is the rambling place. You're you're in the right spot. Um, I have, I bought a couple ESP32 cam boards, and I've had a real hard time programming them. Can you um, can you explain the solution you came up with for programming them and uh, why they're so difficult to program? Maybe. Okay, so the ESP cam, it's, um, I'm not sure who came up with uh, that module. It's basically like, okay, we have um, the ESP8266 as the, let's say the microcontroller that is built on these modules. And usually you have to upload some code on, on that microcontroller. And the only interface that's provided by, by the ESP32 um, is uh, the serial interface. That's like very basic uh, interface with two wires, uh, input, output. And um, there is no simple way to connect it to a computer since the computers don't have like a serial port anymore. So you have to have some kind of USB to serial converter that's usually built on any board that you get for, for tinkering nowadays. You have like a USB port, you connect it to the USB port and then um, Arduino IDE, so the, the development uh, software is able to connect to the microcontroller. And as on, on these boards, there's there are packed of features. There is a camera, there is an SD card slot and um, the ESP32, but they didn't put any serial to USB converter on, on that board. So that's why it's hard to program it. You have to put on some wires on your breadboard and get like um, another module that's converting from, from serial to, to USB to be able to upload some code. And that's a little bit difficult. But the module itself is quite cool because you have like for, I don't know, you get it for maybe $6 now or $5 if you are lucky, uh, a complete uh, small development board where you can, with a camera, that you can take a low quality picture, store it on SD card, and you have even like an LED which you could use to to light the scene because it's quite quite bright and it has wi-fi built in and bluetooth if you need it so i don't know if i answered the question yeah you, yeah, you sort of did you you skipped over the part where i was where i was pointing you towards because you came up with a <laughs> unique solution for this oh yeah uh the unique solution is <laughs> since since um it's like hard to, for me especially, it's hard to explain every time. Brian did a video on that, uh, I think, first, uh, how to connect this specific, uh, I'm talking about Brian Luck, uh, which you had as a guest recently. And um, 
he made a complete video on how to connect this with the serial programmer or serial uh, interface to your computer. And that's a step that holds people back from enjoying the module itself. It's like a hurdle that you have to overcome to get to the good part, to grab, to upload a simple example from the Arduino IDE, which already provides a Wi-Fi access point that shows you a live image from this small module. So there's this hard part where you have to take some wires and get another uh, module and connect it to get to the good part. And I thought, okay, let's simply take the missing part, which is this serial USB serial converter and put it like a shield on top of this module and that's it. And you can simply connect it to the USB. You get the power for, from USB and you can program it uh, at once without taking any wires. Okay, you have to solder maybe the jumper, uh, the, the pin headers, but that's all. And you used to sell this board on, on Tindy before yeah. the Corona explosion, I guess. Oh yeah, I, I sold it until I, I'm actually currently even sold out, but I have a few remaining boards and one is sitting next to me in an envelope, which I will send you. <laughs> Um, um, I had like, I don't know how many I sold. I sold them on, on Tindy, which is a, this, um, small platform for, for makers where they can sell the, the products. And I made this board and sold, I, I'm not sure how many pieces, maybe 600, 800 or something. It's not, not that many, um, but I wanted for people who want to start like doing the projects that I shown with uh, like um, the camera, I did two projects. Actually, one was like a live uh, effect uh, on the LED wall as well as a time-lapse camera project which was also very simple um, I wanted for the people who are not very deep in the in this topic like setting up microcontrollers and uh, serial adapters and so on to simply get a chance to get a cheap board which they can plug this module in and uh, simply start with the project without uh, having to think about it. And then you just program it through the Arduino IDE or what do you use yeah. to program it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can, you can basically, uh, it's, it's like, it shows up like an Arduino because it's the Arduinos also work with, uh, at least the most Ar Arduinos did work with a uh, serial interface uh, you simply pick then, uh, the serial, uh, port and uh, you can program it like any other development board way they, where they didn't skip this part. So at least it just then wor works like uh, the other ESP32 microcontrollers with, which have um, the USB port on them. And um, do you think that your Tindy store will ever be back operational or do you think um worldwide shipping is just too volatile right now oh yeah that's that's currently one problem um so i started my tindy store with the vga boards that was a completely different project and um that went quite well and it uh, at that point where i started my tindy uh, store i was really happy on one side since that money that I got extra from from that income I spent that simply on new stuff on new hardware that I needed also on uh, computer equipment I need a lot of storage and I need like 10 gigabytes uh, 10 terabyte hard drives like on the regular 
<laughs> basis like every few months I need another uh, fat hard drive to store my 4k footage on on that and um, that was financing quite a lot of that um, basically at some point that Tindy stuff covered uh, the most expenses that I had with developing the next board and um, the the programmers uh, they I partially I made them here with my pick and place machine and partially I let them manufacture by Makerfabs in, in China and they ship it to me and I uh, check them for uh, with my with my tester and uh, clean them up because sometimes you have some like uh, quality issues or something so I basically repack them and put them in envelopes and uh, sent the orders out to all over the world and now with last year with uh, COVID it's uh, simply the postal service the German postal service stopped to sh stopped shipping to US Canada Australia basically that started like stopping shipping to these countries and then uh, the only thing that worked at the end like in the middle of the year was um, Europe and I stopped shipping overseas then overseas come came back like they the, the, there was like you get when I when I was like printing the labels or buying the labels uh, in the postal service online there was always like a note okay you can ship to Canada but it won't uh, won't go with like the airplane it will be uh, going with the ship and that takes quite a lot of time or something a warning and I t I said okay yeah I will start shipping to Canada to US and Australia again because it's working it will take a longer time I added a note to um, to the Tindy store uh, for the shipping method that it will take longer but at the end I had like um, one example is I shipped stuff from November uh, 2020 shipped stuff to Australia Canada US I think all the Canadian uh, orders arrived but the US orders and the Australian orders were so delayed that the, I got like for each order I had like complaints or people writing and asking when it's arriving and this is like a small board that I sell for 11 12 dollars and then I spent for an in individual order for one of that board where I have a few dollars of margin I spent half an hour of handling uh, like the communication and uh, at the end I had to refund a lot of people or I, I did that at, at least I know that there was never a shipping that was lost they came I have few shippings that simply came back um, after two months or something um, so there is no doubt that there there barely is any order that that gets lost but I had like one guy that ordered from Australia and he ordered for $60 I think five boards or something and they didn't arrive until uh, mid of January so it took more than two months to get there and he was really cool he said oh yeah I don't mind I just want a board uh, and I I had to I simply refunded uh, when I saw there was like an order that that's that didn't arrive after six weeks I simply refunded everyone and at the end I had like the additional cost of the shipping the, the shipping cost I wouldn't get that return from from the shipping uh, service so um, I had to spend like this for the shipping and refunded everything to the people because I wouldn't care like uh, negotiating how much I will refund someone if a shipping is lost and uh, I simply refunded everyone that was still waiting on their boards and simply closed my my uh, Tindy store because it was like my last product that I had 
uh, on stock and I have only like 20 units left or 10 units left, it's not worth to ship another batch to US, which will not arrive until in two months or something. So basically quite a lot of trouble. And I know like Brian is also shipping a lot of stuff and he paused his uh, shop as well as far as I know, because it's, it's getting out of hand with, with the, uh, yeah, with the shipping. It's like, it's not possible to, to get it right, right now. Yeah, it's pretty nuts. Um, there was a time, well, I'll tell you, I got a package uh, from China, mind you, but I got a package last week that I ordered in last uh, August. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that's the longest I've, it's ever been. But everything is messed up. Like the whole the whole chain, right? Corona hit the entire yeah. world. The, the planet yeah. is under a pandemic. But um, you mentioned Brian Locke a few times in this podcast, uh, he states that it's your fault that he even started a YouTube channel. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, it might be, yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, so, <laughs> I mentioned him, him a few times because he was a guest uh, recently and um, also Unexpected Maker. We are like uh, friends, really buddies, let's say. We are on David Watts, so David Watts has a Discord and I was invited at some point. Um, and uh, I met a few makers there and Brian is one of the makers that isn't from Germany that I actually met because he came to Germany uh, to, to be on, uh, at the Maker Fair in, was it Hannover or Berlin? I always get it wrong. Uh, no matter, uh, it doesn't matter because uh, we we are really like super cool uh, buddies and I don't mind that he <laughs> he says that I'm a lazy guy. He really nailed it. Uh, I, I, so uh, I didn't know it until he showed me the screenshot of the comment that he made under one of my videos uh, where he suggested I try his library or something and I... Since I'm so so lazy, I don't say okay. I I'm let's say I'm efficient with <laughs> with my. <laughs> this sounds like the politically correct way to say it. Um, one thing that he said was last time was that um, there is something, or, or and I'm not sure. Who of you said that? But, but um, there is something if you, since we are all self-taught on the topics and we document that uh, while we are going through uh, that, that thought process, um, it's easier to explain for us in like basic terminology to the people who don't know anything about that, then it is for an expert to do so. So I, I think that was Brian that said that because he's a really yeah. brilliant guy. Yeah, he actually is. Yeah, I'm surprised. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, he's like, uh, he has like so genius projects like his power blogger. It's like the simplest board ever, but he is so success successful with that. It simply meets a requirement. It's even simpler than, than my programmer that I sold for the cameras. It's like, there is no active part. It's just wiring and that's all. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So what I was basically, what I wanted to say is that um, I learn many things from YouTube and from YouTube videos. And that's why I started to do YouTube as well, because I was only, um, one reason was I wanted to build something and that's the way to start tinkering with electronics. I wanted to build like this organ pedals, this MIDI organ pedals. And I ha had a rough idea how it, should be and then I started this process and at this time 
I thought, okay, yeah, maybe I should start to record what I'm doing here because uh, earlier I had a, like a simple homepage where I built a wooden bench for, for my kitchen. And I simply uploaded only just some, some pictures of the bench and how I solved some, some stuff there. And people looked up my email address, I don't know how, and sent me an email that my bench looks cool and that they are grateful that I shared it. And it was like really surprising to me at this point. Okay, such simple things like sharing a few pictures on the internet had like an impact on an, a person that was looking to build a similar bench that he took the effort to look for my email address somewhere. I don't know where because the, the, the page was simply the pictures and like one sentence underneath each of the picture. And he took the effort to thank me over email and, and putting in like 15 minutes to, to search my email address or, or anything. So I thought, okay, then I, if I do like more tinkering, I should maybe just let the camera run and, and narrate it or, or something. I enjoyed uh, EV block at that time, uh, Charles Lore. Um, so that was uh, Julian uh, also. Uh, we had like, so there are a few electronics makers were, which were inspiring at that time. And I thought, okay, why don't, why don't I just try it as well to record everything I do? put it together and upload it as a video. And yeah, that's basically how it started. Yeah, and I think we're all happy that it started because then it gave us awesome videos like your LED wall, which shows what you can do with a, honestly a minimal amount of stuff. You don't need a lot to get started on a small scale, one of those. And oh yeah, the, the first LED wall is really simple. It's like you don't need to know anything. It's like really a blinking LED project. That's, that's right up my alley. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but uh, if you say, okay, like the LED wall version three is very like super intricate and so many stuff is solved there. And But if you rewind my channel to the first videos and look at them, they are very bad lit audio is horrible you can barely follow the stuff i have so many mistakes in my uh, uh, screens or slides that i show and explain stuff but still there have been comments from people encouraging oh yeah uh, thanks you explained it in a very simple way to me which i wasn't able to like get it when I read it in a book or something. So that's the reason why I asked Brian in that comment where, where he suggested to use his Telegram uh, Telegram bot. I suggested, oh, is there a video on that? Do you have, it, it wasn't, I, I simply asked him if there is, I then maybe encourage people, okay, why don't you simply explain how it works to me? It's always simpler to get it basically explained than trying to, I don't know, go through code or something. Yeah, and have the creator of the library explain something yeah. is, is a lot different than going through like the GitHub. I'm sure like the GitHub is written properly, but it's still a lot easier when the creator... Not mine, it... not my <laughs> GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question that I give to all of my... Um, interviewees and uh, I'd like to get to it with you so uh, so I can actually get you back to your day because you spent a lot of time already but the no, setup it's okay <laughs> the setup is that uh, there's a government agency uh, that wants to fund you to make the business of your dreams it doesn't have to be profitable but you do have to provide a service or a product what kind of business would you start Are there limits? No limits. It's your imagination. Open question. Okay. 
what when I heard this question on the podcast you did with Brian, um, then I thought, okay, what what came first in, into my mind is um, to maybe fund or create a, like a maker space, a hacker space of some sort. So I was I was uh, like. I helped with with one makerspace in the past when when I started tinkering. Um, I was involved. I gave co courses in CNC and um, but then like the makerspace wasn't public anymore. Like the cre the founder of this makerspace closed it, and I was really like put off by that. Um, but uh, I really enjoyed like um helping people to to start with stuff i learned cnc back then myself so how you control cnc and um how you can make like vectors and uh, create like basic stuff that you can mill out of basic plywood or something mm, and i did a lot of that stuff back then and i think um, it's very important to have spaces like that, open spaces where especially children or uh, young people can go where they don't need to get all the machines themselves. So it's quite hard to start doing CNC stuff if you don't have a CNC. But a CNC costs thousands of dollars if you want a proper one or a, you can start with a small one, of course, for 150 bucks. But as you said it, your hobby is quite dependent on your garage and the equipment there and if it's heated or not. And um, simply providing a space where people can go or children or even maybe adults go and learn and take a look at this stuff to yeah to spread this hobby to to make it accessible to learn easier so you don't have to take care of your own lab here you can go there and be part and exchange i would i would say i would invest in creating such more more open spaces where people can go with, which are not struggling with with funds because that's a big part of that they're always struggling with funds to get the machines they're dependent on donations from from companies where they just throw out the old cnc so that would be that would be like one thing that i would do i wouldn't want to to just I would like to manage this maybe, but not giving the courses myself because that, that wouldn't scale at this point. I would just take what, you, what the government would offer me and would try to leverage it somehow and uh, get the people that, um, that want to be part of it and create maybe open spaces where kids can go and, and learn that, that stuff. I feel like the makerspace is a common answer and I don't think it's any mistake that it's a common answer. I mean, we're all makers and I think we've all sort of uh, struggled with, you know, I could do this project if just I had access to X, Y, and Z. I wonder if there's, and I'm just thinking out loud here, but I wonder if there's some sort of organization that makers could, uh, could do and maybe teach those classes, maybe make videos specifically aimed towards um, teaching the parts that we know well. Like while you were speaking, you were saying that you'd want someone else to, to teach the, the courses, probably because you don't feel confident enough in certain subjects to teach them. But if I look at someone like um, Billy Rubin, who is at this point uh, very, um, very well skilled in um, making especially 3D printing um, between functional and fashion stuff, um, she could fill that void to teach that portion. 
I could teach people about, you know, uh, cars and, and stuff like that and how microcontrollers or how computers work inside of cars. And like there's I think we all have our own specialties. I just wonder if somehow there was a way to sort of group that up together in one spot for people to to find it and have a little bit more of focus because basically on on YouTube we kind of make whatever we want and our channels are kind of scattered and because of the algorithm it might be hard for someone trying to learn specific skills to find us but just just thinking out loud I feel like there's some sort of solution that eventually we could come up with I would imagine that's something that that might be the future of schools and universities and we have like the way that we teach kids right now is really deprecated it's like you you are like thought one thing you want like like if you will be a mechanic, you learn this, 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 or th that's the way to go. Or you go to university, you learn computer science and you learn, learn coding, but then you are already like, like I did, I did my master's in computer science. You, while you are there, you're learning, like you learned a lot of, of programming languages. After like five years, I already thought, yeah, I'm so old school. I'm coding in C++, C, Java, but now we have Python and what's this other thing? And then like every year there's a new program, programming language. And so the way we school or the schools and, and everything is set up isn't like isn't like um it's not flexible that's keep, for sure no it's not yeah it's not flexible but it also can't keep up with the development it's like maybe it's it gets philosophical at this point because we are going towards the singularity and we have like exponential information exchange on on uh between all humanity let's say but still one person learns like one trait that uh, is thought like, and then you get bored after five years of doing that. That's what happened to me. I quit after five years and started a company uh, when I was working full time as a, a coder. I was like, in the, I was sitting in the, uh, in the, at the work, I was like sitting in front of, of the computer and was thinking, Oh man, I can't I can imagine doing that until the end of my life. I was so depressed about the fact that I have to sit there even though it was most I had so many interesting stuff that I did uh, coding, uh, medical stuff and and uh, much 3D graphics, everything I wanted. But I had like this moments where I simply took my <laughs> my basic phone and played sudoku on the toilet <laughs> at work so that was the point where i thought no i i can't do this anymore i will start something on my own and uh that's like i think at this point when we see how many possibilities there are we get the vision we could be anything you can learn everything from from youtube you can learn anything from from wikipedia at least it's getting more and more frustrated to be like tucked in a day job that you have to do whole life and they wouldn't exp like if you want to do something something else you have to provide like a certificate that you learned that at university or something it's it's not like that anymore. And that's also what, what Elon Musk says. He doesn't want to see, he doesn't value a college degree that much. He wants the passion for, for something. And yeah, it's, I think the world will change such that rather we invest our energy and our time in things that we are passionate about. Yeah. I hope so. I hope so too. Um, 
just uh, just going to close off a little bit. Uh, mind you, Bitlooney doesn't know I'm going to say this, but uh, I went on to his Patreon, and I can see that there's uh, different levels here, but one of them is exclusive, the, the crew level. There's only four left of 20. Oh, really? Yeah, so... If you're listening to this and want to support BitLooney, I suggest no. you go and oh, pick it up. <laughs> no, no, I did. I don't even know that I had this level. Yeah, I did. you had the talk with Brian about about levels and and pressure that you feel from from crowd uh, crowd uh, stuff. I, yep. I really rather suggest support like simple electronics. No, that's not how this works. <laughs> Um, yeah, it works like that. But everyone I, who listens to you yeah. should rather support you, so you get like what you said. You lack lack maybe the the funds to do your three D printer project, and I would be interested to see it. And if you like, say I can justify my hobby with like to be even more expensive, and you would stop at some point. I would rather want you to get all the patrons and all the money so you can f so you can finish it and present it on on youtube and i can watch it and enjoy it so let me uh, put everyone's mind at ease the i have three major projects i'm working on and they will all be released independent of funding so don't worry about <laughs> that um the, basically the only difference between um youtube and not youtube is that youtube offsets the cost a little bit so I can be a little bit more ambitious sooner um, I would have built a giant 3d printer by the way it's a 300 uh, 300 by 500 by 250 um, heated bed 3d printer using um, core XY mechanisms and uh, oh fairly we, we can we can we can talk another hour about uh, about core XY and 3d printer stuff <laughs> oh man, I I would love that, but you know I think uh, this is the frustrating part when you when you get into a groove, because if we go far over two hours, then um, the the listenership goes down. So then basically nobody oh. gets the no nobody gets the thing. How about how about this though? Um, I would love to have you on for a second episode at some point in the near future, and so oh man, if you would be up for uh. that, I would be up for that too. Or you cut like an hour from the rambling before. <laughs> <laughs> because we did. No, sure. So sure, we can, we can, we can and, do it again. And folks, that's how you pressure a guest to a second episode. No, on, uh... no, really. <laughs> I, I, I rather talk about constructive stuff. So uh, I would, I would love to be like on a second part, and we simply focus. We got all this history out of the way. <laughs> So we can focus on the project and, and yeah. talk and about that. Yeah. In fact, um, right now the 3D printer only exists as a pile of parts and uh, sort of a mental plan. So, so perhaps on the next episode, I'll have something more to talk about, something more concrete, and then maybe we can talk about the problems I encounter and um, and the problems you've encountered. Because I've seen you've you've built a 3D printer as well. Um, oh yeah, I did. And then maybe the viewers, the listeners, they can. Um, get something from it, like the way we solve the problems or or whatever. So that could be a good way to approach it. Yeah, sure, sure. But no pressure with that. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, not, yeah. not that you that you feel the pressure now to to get along with this project quickly or something. <laughs> no, no, it can't. It can't go quickly. It it cannot. It has to be because the the problem is uh, I do have yeah. a lot of money tied into it. So if I make a, an an <laughs> error. Um, it's a big error. It Lost fallacy. Uh, yeah, sunk cost yeah. fallacy. Yep. <laughs> sunk cost. Sunk cost fallacy. <laughs> yeah, I have a, I have a, you know, a university education that I didn't finish, so that's how I know that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, you know what? One fun fact: I, I was, um, I was, I studied thirty semesters on the university. So at least I was, so it's not like in, let's say, US where you have to pay each semester like huge amounts of, of uh, cash for, for the college. Um, you can simply study and you get some deadlines, but uh, with my 
in at my university i was at the point where i wasn't pressured to meet any deadlines and i dragged my complete uh, university studies for 30 semesters so 15 years yeah i did i did 10 uh, 10 <laughs> semesters of a four uh, an eight semester program um, and i still have two semesters to go if i ever wanted to finish it like it was just it was not my passion. I was just trying to find something. Like I got to a point at the at the garage where I was um, basically all day doing parody songs, like just singing out loud because I had nothing else to occupy my brain. Like once you get into a rhythm, you're doing the same thing over and over and over. And the amount of times you're doing some interesting diagnostics is very low. And so yeah. I was going nuts and I was like, you know what? I need a job that doesn't ruin my body so much that I can just get over, you know, like do it in, in eight hours and come home and have the energy to pursue hobbies because this isn't working out for me. Like it wasn't, uh, it wasn't working, but, um, thankfully in the fifth, my, my fifth year of university, you know, semester 10, I got a, um, one of my job applications that I've been applying for forever. Uh, to teach at the college came through and the the coordinator basically what happened is I had an apprentice um, working with me at the shop and I was going to university as well and the apprentice was going to college to get his levels done we have three levels they have to complete and he was coming in outside of his shift to talk to me about the stuff that he was seeing in class and I had to explain it all to him. So he had gone back to the college and he had complained to the, the the coordinator of the program. He said, your teachers are garbage. I have to go, well, one specific teacher he was talking about. He's like, I have to go back to work to talk to this guy that that is my, basically I was like in charge of him. He was on my shift. Um, I have to talk to this guy for him to explain. He does a way better job than the guys that you pay for. And he was like, just venting his frustration and the coordinator's like well you know what if this guy is so good have him send me a resume so so you know he checked and actually i had sent a resume so when that teacher that he had problems with quit all of a sudden he called me on a saturday and he's like hey uh do you still want to do this and i'm like yeah he's like okay can you come in on monday i was like uh yeah like let's do it and that the rest is history so i was very oh, lucky wow. to get that position so I quit college oh, at that point. No, 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 no. That's not lucky. That's like karma. That's a beautiful story of good karma. Yeah, like I have to say I'm ex extremely lucky because in my in my town, there's probably only 13 of these jobs available. So I'm very lucky to have one of them. And uh, yeah, I, I, I count my blessings that I'm actually, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing in life. This is, yeah, this is my yeah, calling. It's, it's it's actually it's like it's really it you you wouldn't have to take take the time to explain things to your apprentice there so uh, basically it was your fate <laughs> fate yeah here's here's hoping that uh, it sticks around because it's obviously it's contract to contract uh, uh you know north america yeah. we don't really our our teachers aren't super high on the priority list um so mm. that's why i have um, sort of um, on and off income like I'll have maybe uh, maybe I get two or three contracts or in a year and you know that supports me for the entire year but you know hopefully you know I always hope at the end of my contract that I get another one because it's not really tied to my performance mm. so much my boss says my performance is great that's not a problem but if mm. the province wants to fund the programs that the college puts on that's when I get a contract. If the province decides that they've had enough, they want to go a different direction, they don't want to do this anymore, then I'm out of work and there's nothing There's nothing I can do about it, which is why YouTube is sort of hedging my bets. I'm doing what I love. I'm still teaching in a way and I'm tinkering and whatever. Um, yeah. But hopefully it becomes a resume for if I need to look for work, I have something to prove that, hey, look, like I'm doing stuff. Like you can you can go see what I'm doing type thing. Oh yeah, that's true. Maybe at some point, if if you go to Tesla or something, 
I have. Uh, would I've what, had the would chance. Would you like to work there? Yes and no. So the yes is because uh, I love learning new technologies. Like whenever I work at a Honda dealership, and yeah. That's great because I get to see exactly how the manufacturer wants me to look at their cars, how they want me to work on their cars. It's it's great getting it right from the the horse's mouth. But the problem with that is I don't get exposed to different ways of doing things as much. So whenever there's mm. a car that's not a Honda coming into the shop, I'm like all over it. I want to see what kind of bolts they use, what what kind of suspension designs they they use. They they all use fairly similar designs, but the the execution is completely different. So I'm I'm all up in there. So I would I would accept a job at Tesla as long as it was it would allow me to still teach. Um, mm. As long as yeah, as long as it would allow me to still teach, I would uh, I would accept a, a job there for sure. Hundred cool. percent. I love I love technology it's it's amazing yeah you sound like you're a really curious curious guy and Fair. that's 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 something we all we we make us maybe share across across youtube yeah no matter, I'll no matter which maker yeah i'll give you an example uh whenever i get a failed part most people you know you diagnose the part and then you replace the part and you chuck the old one in the recycling but i would always open the parts up to see the exact failure. I could prove that it was failed, but I wanted to know what exactly on the inside was failed, ah. whether it be like if I diagnose an open uh, in the coil, for example, I want to see yeah. at what point in that coil did it fail? Did it fail at the solder joint? Did it fail at the connector? Did it fail uh, like around the, 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 the winding? Like where did it fail? So that was where my curiosity brought me all the time. Interesting. So you're, You have a lot with AVE in common then. <laughs> yep. Uh, three channels have informed my YouTube channel, which is uh, AVE, uh, Julian Eilert, and Big Clive. Those are the big three that I started watching from yeah, the beginning. Yeah, Big Clive. Yeah, sure. He does that as well. Yeah. He also looks inside of things. Yeah. Except uh, I think AVE has formal training. Um, yeah. It's, Julian Eilert has been doing electronics for like... I want him as a podcast guest, so I'll be nice. I'll say 50 years. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding, a long time. And uh, Big Clive as well. He's been like just a, a force in the electronics uh, uh, space. So so they, you know, they're the northern star, but like for sure they're so knowledgeable, especially when you compare to me, which I'm basically my YouTube channel is a learning channel. It's me literally learning. Yeah, but that's a good thing. But yeah, I think I think we should wrap it up and save some <laughs> for uh, episode two. Although it is uh, bittersweet because this has been a fantastic um, conversation. I really thank you for coming on. Oh yeah, I enjoyed it as well. I'm looking forward to the to the next part. Yeah, hopefully if I'll you want, have... if you if you are up for for it. Oh, hundred percent. Like I would never, <laughs> I would never refuse a, a second episode. I have never had a bad guest on my podcast and. Uh, I'll add you to the list of the good guests as well. Oh. This has been awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> And for the listeners, thank you guys for listening. I would uh, strongly suggest you go over to BitLooney's uh, channel and hit the subscribe button as YouTubers. It's a really big deal for us, um, you know, for more for our morale, for our for the the stats, for YouTube to suggest it. I, I would really recommend you do that. Um, if you feel like it, support BitLooney. He'll tell you no, but I'll tell you yes. And um, I hope to catch you guys in the next episode. Have a good one.